Jayad, my good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure having this discussion with you in the context of the uh, 2021 Copenhagen World Pride. Happy Pride, by the way. Happy Pride. Happy Pride to everyone. You've come here at the beginning of this week, like most of us have, and it is such a buzzing beehive uh, after the months of COVID where people couldn't meet. Uh, everybody is actually flocking and converging together here in Copenhagen. Many young activists, I mean mainly young activists coming to um, make their cause and uh, have their discussions and exchange and have their debates. Uh, we had the opening of the uh, Human Rights Conference at the UN City yesterday with uh, several personalities from the UN. You could feel the willingness, uh, the appetite of youth to engage on LGBTIQ issues and of course to call also the UN for action uh, on all those issues. Now you were in several of these panels, I guess you have a busy week ahead of you. Uh, what brought you to Copenhagen and to the World Pride and how does your week look? I'm very excited to be here in Copenhagen for uh, Copenhagen 2021. This is actually the first time that I got to travel um, in one and a half years after the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's really nice to be at a place where you are among friends, where you are among allies. Um, I think for me, the most important thing of being here, being in this place, being with you, being with all of our young activists is the solidarity that we see across borders, across continents, people really coming together um, to put their foot down and say, we are behind this agenda. We are here to recognize LGBTIQ rights as human rights, and he, we are here to work together. Uh, so what brings me here is my commitment to include LGBTIQ youth and their voices in the work that I do at the UN. Um, so as the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, I work to bring the United Nations closer to young people and bring young people closer to the UN. But as you said, LGBTIQ youth voices have been left out for a very long time for various reasons. We are here to make sure that that doesn't happen, that no one, absolutely no one is left behind. Which is a way the sense of uh, Agenda 2030 and the implementation of our beloved SDGs, which across the spectrum, of course, also involve LGBTI youth and uh, LGBTI communities in general. Maybe you want to say a word as well on um, what uh, the achievements of uh, the Office of the Envoy of the Secretary General for Youth have been recently. You've uh, recently published, launched a report on protection of youth and creating safe space, which is uh, answering a long-standing request of youth uh, in order to have protection mechanisms and uh, to have those safe spaces. You, can you tell us a little bit more about this, this report? Of course, in the past few years, we've seen young people take charge or take the lead when it comes to advocating for the issues that we care most about. If you take climate action, if you take LGBTIQ rights, if you take, for an example, the movement on Black Lives Matter, on um, uh, gun violence in, in the United States, for an example, um, the democratic revolutions that happened in Sudan, um, in Iraq, in Chile, in Peru, it was young people who were out there on the streets um, really calling out their governments, the policy makers, people who were in power and holding them accountable for the commitments they have made including the SDGs. But we also know that um, civic spaces can always not be safe for young people. There are instances where young people are targeted, discriminated against because of their age. We had these anecdotal evidences, we had these stories that young activists would share with us from around the world, but we did not have a systemic way of collecting this data. So last year, for the first time, my office conducted a global study on um, the protection of young people in civic spaces, and we consulted over 500 young human rights defenders and activists from around the world, including young LGBTIQ activists, um, and we asked them a very fundamental question, um, do they feel safe? in their activism? Do they feel supported in their activism? 
and do they feel respected when they engage in the activism and unfortunately and to maybe unsurprisingly to many of us who work in this space the answers to these questions were negative um, young people did not feel the spaces they were engaging in were safe they also didn't feel adequately supported by adults by allies by the UN by their governments um, and sometimes even by civil society organizations that they work with so there is a need to dissect and analyze what really are the challenges that are holding young people back or that are um, contributing to unsafe environments for them to be activists. So we, we figure that there are social barriers, cultural barriers, economic barriers, political barriers, um, legal barriers, and we analyze in the report six types of barriers that prevent young people fully realizing their potential as advo activists and advocates. So. I encourage everyone to read the report um, and to uh, use the recommendations in the report, which are very diverse. We have recommendations for governments, for the UN, for civil society organizations, and to really share power. Because you cannot always think of young people as the future because they're here right now. They are the present. So you have to share power with them today if you are to help them make change in the future. Uh, you said a beautiful sentence, share power with them. I think what came out this week in Copenhagen is this uh, eagerness to participate, to act with the international institutions and to have the institutions act with youth on LGBTIQ issues. Now I understand protection is of course the first condition that has to be met in order to have action to happen. I understand this is the objective of your report. The report is only a first step. I guess the activities and the work will continue throughout the next session of the United Nations General Assembly as well. Um, I understand there's also a whole launch of dialogues with queer uh, youth. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. And then you said sharing the power. How can the UN concretely share the power with young people? How can young people be involved uh, in a very efficient, concrete way, which goes beyond the rhetorics uh, in what the Secretary General calls this uh, networked multilateralism, where the UN really needs to reach out to other partners and youth is, of course, a privileged partner. Of course, I think um, Alex and you've helped us a lot last year to really convene dialogues around the UN 75 process. We were celebrating the UN 75th birthday and the UN engaged in this listening exercise to listen to people around the world and to maybe unsurprisingly, it was mostly young people who spoke up, who took the survey and who told us how the UN can be better uh, to better be better fit to respond to the challenges of the future. Um, and and I think we had a very humble learning opportunity in listening to young people. They were telling us, well, I know that you are trying to engage with young people, but who are the young people you are engaging with? Because we don't see disabled young people in your meetings. We don't see LGBTIQ young people in your meetings. We don't see refugee youth in your meetings, which really help us take a very critical look at you and zone programming on youth and to realize that well in our intention to leave no one behind, maybe we are leaving certain groups out. So it was very important for us to acknowledge this and come up with specific strategies to include these groups which, are, which were specifically being marginalized because of the specific vulnerabilities that they have as a group. So uh, in uh, including the queer youth voices, one of the things we realized in the dialogues with the queer youth organizations is that queer youth organizations often lack access to spaces and they often lack funding and infrastructure to organize themselves. So I um, spoke to the independent expert on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, Vikram Adrigar Boros, and we came together with ILGA World and the Queer Youth Network to launch a series of dialogues called Queer Youth Dialogues. We have two objectives. The first objective is to be facilitators so that queer youth organizations can self-organize themselves, come up with their own positions and contribute to UN processes. So the next time I organize mental health uh, conferences, I want those queer youth voices there. Next time we organize the youth participation to the COP for the climate negotiations, we need queer youth voices there. So mainstreaming of 
exactly mainstreaming those voices and really giving them that platform to uh, jointly come up with a position as the queer youth civil society and secondly for them to give the entry points to the un how can queer youth influence the proceedings of the human rights council how can queer youth influence the proceedings of the economic and social council so we want to make sure that this information is readily available to queer youth organizations so they can develop their own strategies as to how they contribute so i invite everyone to join the queer youth dialogues it is an open invitation we've just had our first dialogue but it's a series of dialogues we will continue um throughout until the year, right? throughout the year until the ida hobbit uh, of 2022 which the un will of course celebrate of course uh, and we will end with that celebration and on a high note but it's really only the beginning uh, and and providing this infrastructure so that queer youth can organize themselves with the hope that one day we will not need to provide that platform that they will be empowered enough they will have the resources and they will have the uh, tools necessary to organize by themselves um and to answer the last part of your question alex um what's next i think for the un to share power there are very specific two things that that we can do first is invest um i think we talk a lot about engagement of young people about queer young people i think having um the opening of the human rights forum here at the un was itself a a big step but we often don't put money where our mouth is and if we are to invest um money in bringing queer youth voices into the conversations of the un i think our conversations will get much richer much diverse and um, much relevant to the young people that we are trying to serve so investing in creating spaces for queer youth is extremely important and secondly i would say invest in queer youth organizations directly because often we know that in places where it's illegal to be or criminal to be gay or less be no bisexual or trans how can you expect organizations to you know be formally registered ngos it's not possible so many of these organizations are informal networks of volunteers coming together so that you know they can build a community around themselves so as donors as funders as institutions we have to be flexible enough to understand how queer youth organize themselves and be able to be flexible enough to open our doors to them but also channel direct funding and support to those organizations so this can be informal ways of support not necessarily formal ways of support and secondly i think protection um i think we still can do a lot more in speaking up uh when queer youth are being targeted being retaliated against being cracked down sometimes by their own governments who are supposed to protect them and sometimes by non state actors and i think we should be fearless in standing up for them exactly in in defending their human rights and really being there to protect queer youth um in in their activism because we ask people to speak up and stand up when you see injustice but if we don't protect them when they do then what trust would they have in a system that is created to pr- promote human rights for everyone everywhere so i would say these two things invest and protect wow. those are my messages for the un thank you jay that's a very powerful message and i guess i mean from what you described quite a welcome um innovative initiative that is coming up with these dialogues with uh, all the activity that that are planned ahead and we are really looking forward to them uh you also noticed uh, as as i had uh, yesterday that um it was symbolic to have the human rights conference for the lgbti rights here at the uh un city uh but the feeling was ambivalent uh, sometimes the feeling is the un doesn't really care about us on the other hand it was a signal that this was taking place here so happy half not that happy what would you tell in very short sentence uh, to the youth that is doubtful about the un how reliable as a partner the un can be what what should make me trust as a young lgbti activist in the un i think it's very easy to be suspicious and you know be be not having that trust i see that um not just towards the un but many young people are also developing a mistrust towards their own governments towards their own institutions but i want everyone to remember that the un charter starts with we the peoples it doesn't say we the straight people we the cis people we the rich people um we the governments it says we the people so every single one of us are and must be protected by 
the organization that we call home, which is the United Nations. I know that it has been a long and hard journey to get where we are today, but I also know that brighter times are ahead and you can count on people like myself, people like Alex, who will be pushing for the, our organizations to be more inclusive as we move forward. Thank you, Jayatma, for this message of hope, for this optimism. Thank you for your enthusiasm, for your commitment, which is never fading, and looking forward to continuing working with you on all these issues. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. Thank you.